Today's presentation is on understanding the importance, the importance of dermatology. It's more than skin deep. Um, and Dr. Anasia is here today. She's going to shed some light on some of the top 10 myths about dermatology, skin cancer, and protecting yourself from the sin from the sun because our skin is our largest organ and sometimes we really kind of forget about that. Um, there's so much of it there and uh, it really is there to protect everything we do. A little bit more about Dr. Anasia. She is a, a board certified dermatologist and a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology. She specializes in general and cosmetic dermatology for all ages. Dr. Anasia received her undergraduate degree at Columbia University in New York. Her interest in dermatology developed during medical school at the Case Western Reserve University Cleveland Clinic. And as a medical student, she was inducted into the prestigious Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. She began a residency training at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and concurrently serves as a clinical teaching fellow at Harvard Medical School. In 2016, she completed her dermatology residency training at the University of Texas in Houston and at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And of course, now she is with Advanced Dermatology, and she'll tell you all the more information in the myths. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Savina Aneja. As uh, Dorothy mentioned, I'm a board-certified dermatologist, and I currently work at Advanced Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery in the Orlando area. Specifically, my offices are located in Winter Park and Lake Nona. Today, the title of my talk is Understanding the Importance of Dermatology, and we're going to talk a little bit about myths in dermatology. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of Dr. Levitt and our whole team at Advanced Dermatology. Advanced Dermatology, we're a very big group. Uh, and the group was initially started by Dr. Levitt in 1989. Currently, we're the largest dermatology group in the, in the United States. And locally in Florida, we have over 180 offices. We also have offices throughout the country. Uh, I think at last count, it was about 13 or 14 different states with significant presence in Colorado, Michigan, as well as in Pennsylvania. Our providers include physicians as well as physician extenders, including PAs as well as nurse practitioners. I included a picture here of what Dr. Levitt looked like, I presume, in 1989. Uh, he doesn't still look like that. This is a picture of what I looked like in 1989. I also still don't look like that, so we've both changed a little bit. Um, so today we're going to talk about myths in dermatology. We're going to talk about misconceptions regarding skin cancer, sunscreen, and tanning. We're also going to talk about the importance of doing full body or total body skin examinations and why it's important to see a dermatologist for that. We're also going to discuss a little bit about the differences between medical dermatology, cosmetic dermatology, as well as surgical dermatology. In the last few minutes, we'll talk about what's ahead in dermatology, and I'll touch upon novel therapeutics and new medications that we can see coming down the pipeline in the next few years. So I've divided this talk into a couple common myths about skin cancer and the field in general. The first one I hear all the time, and it's, I won't get skin cancer, only old people get skin cancer. And unfortunately, this is just not true. We know that one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. In my personal practice, the youngest patient I've seen with skin cancer was actually just 23 years old, and he had a basal cell on his forehead that was fairly aggressive. Uh, we know every day in the United States, thousands of people get diagnosed with skin cancer, approximately 10,000 people every single day. When we talk about skin cancer, we divide it into two categories. That includes melanoma, which is the more aggressive type of skin cancer, as well as non-melanoma skin cancer. Non-melanoma skin cancer includes basal cell and squamous cell. Basal cell of the two is the most indolent. It generally grows locally, but can be destructive to local tissue. Squamous cell is a little bit more worrisome because it does tend to travel to the nodes if it goes undetected, and it can metastasize to other organs. Uh, we know that in the United States, there's probably about 3 million people at a given time who have non-melanoma skin cancer, which is basal cell and squamous cell, and currently there are probably a, a close to over a million patients living with melanoma. A lot of my patients who are older feel like they should come in for skin checks, but don't realize that melanoma can affect younger patients as well. 
Uh, we know that melanoma, which is the most dangerous type of skin cancer, if caught early, can result in excellent cure rates. But if it's detected late, unfortunately, melanoma is associated with a high mortality. And in the United States, we know that approximately one American dies every hour from melanoma. So that's a substantial amount of, of concern that we have for our melanoma patients. What's interesting is that melanoma, we do catch it in all age groups, and it's actually the second most common cancer in young patients between the ages of 15 and 29. So while we do want to encourage our older patients to have skin cancer screenings, younger patients who have family history or a large number of moles also need to be encouraged to perform self-skin examinations at home, as well as come into the office for a full body skin exam. The importance of early detection is something I really like to stress to patients because we know that skin cancer is highly treatable if we catch it early. If we catch a skin cancer when it's a stage zero or a stage one, we have a lot more therapeutic options. If we, get, if we catch a skin cancer much later, our options are limited. The patients we really want to encourage to come in are those with spe specific risk factors. Those would include patients who've had a history of atypical moles, patients who've had over 50 moles, and in Florida, a lot of our patients fall into the category of patients who've had blistering sunburns in childhood, patients who've been lifeguards, patients who've had a history of tanning bed use. Another group we have to be cognizant about are patients who've had a history of systemic immunosuppression. The largest group that this would apply to are patients who've had solid organ transplants. So for example, a patient who's had a renal cell carcinoma or a renal transplant actually has a 65 fold increase in the development of skin cancer. So any patient who's had a solid organ transplant really needs to be screened annually or even at six month intervals for the development of skin cancer. Patients who've had other skin cancers in the past are likely to develop other new ones. The data actually shows that if you've had a non-melanoma skin cancer, a basal cell or a squamous cell, there's a 40% chance you'll have another one at a five year period. The other groups we have to worry about, which is especially important for oncology providers, are patients who have a personal history of breast cancer or thyroid cancer, because there is data to suggest that these groups are also at an increased risk for skin cancer. Uh, when you come into the dermatologist for a total body skin check, what we do is we look you over from head to toe. And we really know that this is a way to catch skin cancers when they're small and easy to treat. This involves looking at the scalp, looking at the soles of the feet, looking at the nail beds, as well as the total body skin surface area. In my patients, I encourage them to treat it like other standard cancer screening. So for patients who've had a history of skin cancer, a family history of melanoma, patients who have a lot of moles, they should consider it a regular cancer screening, like a mammogram, PSA, or colonoscopy. Generally, for patients who have few risk factors, an annual skin exam is sufficient. For patients who are higher risk, for patients who've had solid organ transplants, or for patients who've had problems with skin cancer before, we generally see these patients back at six month intervals. If patients had a recent diagnosis of melanoma in the last one to two years, we actually see them every three to four months for the first few years to make sure they don't develop a second primary melanoma. The reason we're all about early detection is because we know if we detect skin cancers early, they're associated with a much higher rate. Uh, if a melanoma is detected earlier before it transfers to the lymph nodes, it's associated with, over, with an over 90% survival rate. If we catch melanoma later, like a stage 4 melanoma, it's actually associated with only a 20% survival rate at five years. So our goal is to catch melanoma early. Additionally, we also have a lot of therapeutic options that are available to patients if we diagnose skin cancer early. For example, if I biopsy a patient and they have that superficial basal cell on their chest, I could offer them treatment with a topical chemotherapy cream. I could offer them an excision. I could offer them Mohs surgery. I could offer them treatment with electrodesiccation and curatage. They'd also be a candidate for radiation therapy if they desired that treatment. So we have a lot of options if a patient comes in early and we catch a skin cancer when it's tiny. A few months ago, I had a patient who came in with a slowly growing lesion on the lower leg. She'd had it for about two and a half years. It was three centimeters on the lower leg at the time she came in. Uh, we did a biopsy, it came back as a squamous cell, and I talked to my Mohs surgeon colleague to see if she'd be a candidate for Mohs surgery. But unfortunately, the patient had allowed this tumor to grow for too long, and she was no longer a candidate for Mohs surgery. Uh, the next option I offered her would be radiation therapy. She completed two months of radiation, but unfortunately did not receive a complete cure after radiation, and actually did not have any clearance after two months of radiation therapy. Um, I saw her a few weeks ago, 
and now the therapeutic options are very limited. She met with a general surgeon to talk about lower extremity amputation, and she also met with an oncologist to talk about a new PD-1 inhibitor medication called Liptio, which is a systemic medication that can be used for treatment of very aggressive skin cancers. Now, had this patient come in two or three years ago when the skin cancer was five millimeters or one centimeters, we could have probably offered her many more options. Now she's going to choose between systemic immunosuppression with a PD-1 inhibitor or possible lower extremity amputation. So we really want these patients to come in early because we can treat them with a lot more, we have a lot more options to treat them if we see them when they're, when they're at earlier stages. Uh, the second myth we're going to talk about is that patients with darker skin can't get skin cancer. And this is just not true. In my personal practice, I've actually treated a patient of Japanese descent who developed melanoma. I've treated an Indian patient who had multiple basal cells and squamous cells. And while uh, patients with darker skin have a lower risk for skin cancer, they can definitely develop skin cancer. The example I frequently use in my clinic is Bob Marley. As many of you know, he was a famous musician. What's less known about Bob Marley is he actually died of a melanoma that was on his foot in his 30s. Uh, the specific type of melanoma he, have, is, he had is sometimes called acral lentiginous melanoma. This is a melanoma that affects hairless skin on the palms and soles. It's specifically associated with C-kit mutations, which are a little bit different than the mutations we see in the melanomas we develop in the skin on fair skin patients, which are traditionally associated with BRAF mutations. These C-kit mutations are more prevalent on acral melanomas. These acral melanomas account for 70% of melanomas on darker skin patients, which is why we do want darker skin patients to come in for total body skin examinations, and we want to pay special attention to their palms, soles, uh, because these are areas, and nail units, uh, because these are areas where they can develop uh, melanoma as well. Other types of melanoma that are less often spoken about are ocular or uveal melanomas. These are associated traditionally with gene NAC mutations, which again is a little bit different than the skin melanomas, which are more commonly associated with BRAF mutations. Uh, but ophthalmologists do a great job for screening uh, for ocular or uveal melanomas associated with that gene NAC mutation. Other areas patients can develop melanoma include the nasal cavity as well as the mouth, um, which is why in my clinic, part of the skin check is looking in the mouth as well as looking at the external nasal cavity uh, because you can develop melanomas in these areas. Another myth we hear about is tanning isn't bad for your skin unless you get burned. And I hear this from many of my patients who've had skin cancer before, and even patients who've had melanoma, who still believe if they tan a little bit, it's not going to hurt their skin. Unfortunately, this is just not the case. We know that any time we tan, whether it's inside or outside, we're exposed to both UVA and UVB radiation. I tell my patients that UVB, the B should remind them for, should stand for burning, blisters, and other bad things like skin cancer, because UVB radiation is the one that causes all, all of those things. UVA radiation is more associated with skin aging, so I tell them that the A stands for aging, and that's what's going to cause brown spots as well as wrinkles. So we know that both indoor and outdoor tanning, even in limited quantities, is going to contribute to the development of skin cancer as well as premature aging which no one wants. A myth that we've heard about more recently in the media is sunscreen is harmful and it contains chemicals that are dangerous. This is completely untrue. Um, sunscreen does contain a lot of additives, but most of them are very safe to be used on the skin. A recent FDA study looked at sunscreen and the absorption of different chemicals into the skin, and it found that there is probably a little bit more absorption of sunscreen ingredients into the skin than we had previously thought. However, the study did not show that the absorption had any substantial effects on health. The authors of the study stated that individuals should continue to apply sunscreen and indicated that perhaps we need to do a little bit more investigative work on sunscreen, but in no way found that sunscreens were dangerous or harmful. The American Academy of Dermatology recently issued a statement on the safety of sunscreen after reviewing this study and other data. In the study, it was found that only two ingredients were possibly unsafe, and those ingredients are not available in US markets. Um, so we don't have to worry about our patients buying sunscreen from the drugstore and having any problems with the safety of sunscreen. The American Academy of Dermatology uh, issued their position statement, and they reminded us that sunscreen remains an important way to protect ourselves from UV radiation, which can pre 
predispose us to premature aging, as well as stun burns, as well as skin cancer. So I in color urge all of my patients to use sunscreen whenever they're going to be outside and on a daily basis on the face and exposed extremities. Uh, for patients who are less interested in doing sunscreen, there are other therapeutic options. A lot of companies are now making sun protective clothing. So if you go to a sporting goods store or if you go on the internet, you can buy clothing that has sun protection actually built into it. And it's a great alternative to sunscreen as well. Uh, generally, when I'm talking to sunscreen about patients, I encourage them to look for sunscreens that say broad spectrum on the bottle. That means that it has UVA as well as UVB coverage. I always encourage patients to use a sunscreen that's got an SPF of 30 or higher. Uh, and for patients who are going to be at the pool or the beach, which is a common thing in Florida, we want to look for sunscreens that say water resistant or very water resistant. And the difference between these terms is that water resistant sunscreens give you protection for about 40 minutes and very water resistant sunscreens give us protection for about 80 minutes. Uh, I encourage patients to apply sunscreen 10 to 15 minutes before they're going to be outside and then continually reapply it. To get an adequate amount of sunscreen, you actually have to apply one ounce to the whole adult body. And if we think about the average Neutrogena or Aveeno bottle, it's only about two to five ounces. So to actually get the SPF on the bottle, we'd be going through a bottle every two to five applications. So usually we're all under applying sunscreen. Uh, if you think about how long a bottle of sunscreen lasts you, it may last you three or four months, which means we're all getting only a fraction of the SPF coverage that's documented on the bottle. Um, in studies, it's been shown that patients probably get anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of the SPF on the bottle, which is why I always encourage patients to use higher SPF sunscreens. A, a few months ago, our group was able to partner with Dillard's to get the message out that sunscreens are both safe and effective. Um, what we set out to do is break the Guinness World Book record for the most people applying sunscreen at a given time. And we were actually able to have over 2,000 people applying sunscreen at a given time. And so we are the new record holders. Uh, and so we do really believe that sunscreen is safe and effective, and that's a message we want to send out to our patients. Uh, another myth I hear frequently in my clinic who just come, for, from patients who just come in for one spot to be looked at is, I don't have any new spots, so I don't need a full body skin check. Uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, slowly growing lesions can be unnoticed by patients and their partners. Um, here I have a picture of a patient who I saw about six months ago. She came in and she really only wanted her face to be looked at. But with a little encouragement, I convinced her to get into a gown. We looked at her skin, and on the medial thigh, I found this dark mole that's, that's marked by that little blue marker there. And we actually did a biopsy. This actually came back as a stage one melanoma. And so while patients are good at keeping an eye on their own skin at home, we know that there are some places like the back, the posterior neck, the medial thighs that are just impossible for them to see on their own. This is a similar patient. This patient said, I only want to be looked at on the upper body, which is why you can see in the picture he's wearing his khaki pants. Uh, when we took off his shirt, we looked at the spot on the abdomen, and I said, how long have you had that spot? And he said, well, I've had it for five or six years. My primary care has seen it and said it's nothing to worry about. Uh, I said I really didn't like the way it looked, and I said underneath all that hair, it's difficult to really assess if it's been changing. We did a biopsy of this spot, and this spot actually came back as a stage two melanoma. Uh, this is a similar patient with a similar story. He came in for a spot on the forehead. When I shook his hand, I noticed a spot on the thumbnail. Uh, this patient had a biopsy that day, and this also came back as a melanoma. Unfortunately, this patient had had this spot for about two years, and um, now it's a little bit more invasive, and he's actually going to have to have the whole thumb removed. And so uh, while we may see spots that have been around and they're slowly growing, they can still be melanomas. And often these melanomas get detected late. These are just three examples that I've seen in my clinic in the last three, three to six months. And so um, we do need to be doing full body skin checks to catch these melanomas and encouraging our patients to do full body skin exams, even if they don't feel like they have new things that need to be looked at. Often patients have a hard time deciphering old lesions from new lesions, and it is very challenging if a lesion is slowly evolving to notice that it's growing. We do still encourage our patients to do self-skin examinations at home, uh, but it's challenging to do uh, if you're not using a hand mirror as well as a full-length mirror uh, to look at all the surfaces, especially on the scalp, 
the back, the posterior neck, as well as the medial thighs. Uh, another myth I hear occasionally is patients don't need a dermatologist to be screened for skin cancer. Uh, as many of us here know that know, is primary care physicians already have a lot to do during office visits, and it's challenging, challenging for them to look in the scalp, as well as the hands and the soles, as well as the nail units during their office visits. Um, so I do encourage patients to see a board-certified dermatologist for a full body skin check because they have the most advanced training uh, to assess areas that could be concerning for a skin cancer, whether it be a melanoma or a non-melanoma skin cancer. Uh, dermatologists see skin pathologies, but we also see patients who have hair pathologies as well as nail pathologies and mucous membrane pathologies. A few weeks ago, someone said, uh, who I was meeting socially said, I have a patient who has mucous membrane pemphigus, I'm not sure where to send them. And I was like, send them to me. Um, dermatologists do biopsies in the oral cavity, and we also treat patients who have pathologies in the mucous membranes. Uh, some people who are dermatologists have advanced training in our group. Uh, for example, we have several physicians who've gone on to do Mohs Fellowship training. Uh, that means that they're specialized in the treatment of skin cancer as well as advanced facial reconstruction. And so we do encourage patients who have skin cancers, especially on cosmetically sensitive areas, to be seen by a Mohs surgeon because they can offer cure rates at the highest rate as well as a cosmetically pleasing outcome. Uh, other advanced training in dermatology includes dermatopathology fellowships, as well as specialized training in pediatric dermatology. Uh, we also have a few colleagues who do cosmetic fellowships, which can include advanced training in lasers, injectables, or hair restoration. Um, here in Orlando, our group is thankful to partner with Kansas City University to sponsor our own dermatology residency. Uh, here in Orlando. This originated a few years ago and we recently received our ACGME accreditation. We currently have residents uh, in all three classes. We have three residents in each year. Uh, these residents rotate in our outpatient clinics. They also see inpatient consults at Advent Health. They have pediatric rotations as well as dermatopathology rotations. And throughout their three years with us, they're able to also participate in grand rounds as well as journal club. And so we're excited to be able to train the next generation of dermatologists through our residency program. Uh, another myth we hear frequently from the primary care physicians is that it takes months to get an appointment with a dermatologist. Uh, at Advanced Dermatology, we have over 180 offices in Florida, and so we offer many same-day appointments. We also have a little bit of flexibility in scheduling, and there are some evening and weekend appointments available. Uh, in my clinic, we actually start seeing patients at 7 a.m., so I'm often able to see patients before they go to work. Uh, if you're looking for a board-certified dermatologist outside of our group, you can also find them on the AAD website. Uh, specifically, the American Academy of Dermatology has a website called findaderm.aad.org. That website, uh, you can use your zip code to search for a board certified dermatologist in your area. Uh, we know that there is a shortage of dermatologists throughout the country. There's under 9,000 practicing dermatologists across the country, and they account for only 1% of practicing physicians. In the state of Florida, we have about 550 dermatologists who are actively practicing. Uh, there has been some survey data to look at dermatology wait times, and the average dermatology wait time ranges from one day to 165 days across the country. The average is 32 days across the country. In Florida, we're a little bit better than that. We're about 16 days for an appointment in dermatology. Uh, another study compared dermatology to other specialties, specifically cardiology, family medicine, OBGYN, and orthopedic surgery. And unfortunately, dermatology wait times were above average in both mid-size and larger cities. To account for this, we've often employed physician extenders, whether they be PAs or nurse practitioners, to help allow our patients to get in earlier to see a dermatologist. We know that board-certified dermatologists have the most advanced training, but we know that, unfortunately, we need more access to care. Um, to, 
combat this uh, problem with access, Advanced Dermatology has actually created a physician assistant and nurse practitioner fellowship to train our mid-level providers to see patients uh, who have challenging skin conditions. Uh, this program is a six to 12 month immersion program where PAs and NPs can work alongside board certified dermatologists as well as other mid-level providers who've had extensive experience uh, to learn the field of dermatology. During this program, they also participate in journal club, grand rounds, and weekly didactics. They have frequent evaluations by their preceptors, and to complete the program, they actually have to pass a written exam. So we feel like our physician assistants and nurse practitioners have extensive training before they go out to practice. Uh, another thing we hear, which is a common myth, is I don't have insurance, so I can't afford a dermatology appointment. Um, at Advanced Dermatology, we take skin cancer very seriously, and so we do our best to offer free skin cancer screenings to the public whenever we can. In the last few months, I've just cited a handful of free skin cancer events we've participated in. A few months ago, we participated in the women's show. We were there for four days, and each day we offered over 100 free skin cancer screenings for patients. Uh, we're also partnering with Seacoast Bank to offer skin cancer screenings at the bank, and my group was able to do that a few weeks ago. In the fall, we went to Rollins College and we offered free skin cancer screenings to faculty, staff, as well as students at the college. Uh, again, a few months ago in Winter Park, we were able to offer free skin cancer screenings to first responders, including uh, firefighters, police, as well as EMTs. Uh, our group was also at the Special Olympics event a few weeks ago, and we were able to offer free skin cancer screenings there. So there are many opportunities for patients to have free skin cancer screenings, because we really do think it's important for patients to get screened, whether they have insurance or not. On an international level, we actually have residents and faculty every year who go to Nicaragua and other countries in South America to serve the medically underserved community. Uh, another myth we hear is that dermatologists are only interested in cosmetics. Uh, dermatology can be loosely divided into three fields. We have medical dermatology, surgical dermatology, as well as cosmetic dermatology. Uh, but by and large, all dermatologists have extensive training in medical dermatology. Uh, when, dermatology uh, when dermatologists are in training during residency, they have extensive training in medical as well as surgical dermatology. And what's not known is actually most dermatology residencies do not do any cosmetics, and less than 50% offer comprehensive cosmetics and laser training. Uh, some dermatology providers can go on to do fellowships in cosmetics, but you should feel confident that if you're referring a patient to a dermatologist, they have extensive medical and surgical training. What I do find is very common, what I do find is, uh, very common in my clinic is that there's an area of overlap between general dermatology and cosmetic dermatology. I see a lot of patients who have hyperhidrosis, uh, which is a condition of excess sweating, and um, oftentimes we can treat these patients with prescription strength antiperspirants. We can also treat them with oral medications. But more recently, we've been, often, we've been able to offer them a treatment called mirror dry laser therapy, which can actually treat axillary hyperhidrosis in one session. Uh, so patients come into the office, we numb the skin, and we use a laser to actually destroy the sweat glands in the underarm area. And this results in an 80 to 100% reduction in sweating. And for patients, it's really a substantial quality of life improvement. So this is an area where general dermatology can overlap with cosmetic dermatology because the laser therapy is considered cosmetic, although we're treating a medical condition of hyperhidrosis. Uh, we can see similar situations when we have patients who have PCOS and they have associated hirsutism or excess hair. Uh, we know that's a medical condition, but oftentimes patients elect to have treatment with a cosmetic therapy, which is laser hair removal. Um, here I've included a picture of a patient who's actually getting the mirror dry laser treatment. Uh, in my personal practice, I do a good amount of general dermatology. I perform a few surgeries every day, but I also offer patients extensive cosmetic treatments because we do know that patients uh, have improved self-esteem and happiness with cosmetic treatments. But that's only a fraction of the services we offer in our office. Uh, another myth that I used to hear a lot in medical school when people were encouraging me not to become a dermatologist is dermatologists treat everything with topical steroids. And while dermatologists do use topical steroids, it's only a fraction of the therapeutics we can offer patients. Uh, for example, if I have a patient who has psoriasis, there are over 10 topical steroids I could prescribe if they have limited psoriasis. 
but if they have more advanced psoriasis, there are many other therapeutic options. Sometimes we can offer patients therapy with topical vitamin D creams. We can offer them therapy with retinoids. For patients who have extensive psoriasis or for patients who are breastfeeding or pregnant, they're often great candidates for light therapy. We also have a variety of oral medications available to patients. And in the last 10 years, we've, we've had a variety of injectable medications that we can offer patients. This includes TNF inhibitors, IL-17 pathway modifiers, as well as IL-12 and 23 modifiers. And so we do have many therapeutic options available to patients. Another condition we see a lot of is hair loss or alopecia. And sometimes patients can be treated with topical steroids. But we have a wide variety of other treatments. We can treat them with intralesional steroids, topical immunomodulator therapy. Many of my patients are on systemic anti-inflammatories or hormonal medications. Some patients, depending on the type of hair loss they have, are candidates for laser or light therapy. Uh, some patients are candidates for hair restoration. Uh, some patients are candidates for a treatment we call PRP, uh, where we actually take a sample of the patient's blood, we uh, spin it down in the centrifuge, we extract out the growth factors and platelets, and we re-inject these into areas where patients have had hair loss. So there are a wide variety of treatment options based on the patient's type of alopecia. Uh, another condition that we talked about briefly before is hyperhidrosis, and I do see a lot of hyperhidrosis in my, pac in my patient population. These patients can be treated with topical antiperspirants. We also have a variety of oral anticholinergic medications we can use. Uh, depending on where they have hyperhidrosis, some patients are candidates for therapy with iontophoresis. We can also offer patients treatment with botulinum toxin. Or most recently, what I've been doing a lot of is the mirror dry laser because it's a one-time treatment that permanently reduces sweat. Uh, and so a lot of my patients have been electing to treat with mirror dry laser as of late. Uh, for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about advances in dermatology and discuss a few novel therapeutics. Um, in our group at Advanced Dermatology, both our faculty and our residents participate in research and scholarly activity. Oftentimes, it's partnered uh, with Dr. Solomon, who runs Amira Derm Research, which is our clinical trials unit. Dr. Solomon is located in Ormond Beach, and he often enrolls many patients in many of our clinical trials. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple of them briefly. Uh, Particularly in the area of psoriasis, in the last 10 years, we've had a lot of new medications come out. A few years ago, we got Humira. About 15 years ago, we got Humira. And that was a TNF inhibitor. And that did great things for psoriasis. More recently, we have new biologic medications, which include IL-17 inhibitors, IL-12 and 23 pathway modifiers. And currently, Dr. Solomon is enrolling patients in another clinical trial uh, for another systemic medication for patients who have advanced moderate to severe psoriasis. Uh, atopic, atopic dermatitis, or eczema, is another condition we see a lot of. And 15 years ago, these patients were commonly treated with topical steroids or topical immunomodulators. Uh, in the last few years, we've had more medications available to patients who have atopic dermatitis. We have a new topical medication called Eucryza, which has been out for a few years, which is actually a boron derivative. And many of our patients who don't want to be on steroids prefer to be on this Eucryza topical medication. Additionally, a few years ago, we also came out with Dupixent, which is an injectable medication for patients who have more advanced refractory atopic dermatitis. A condition that we see a little less of is called Gorlin syndrome or basal cell nevus syndrome. This is a condition where patients have genetic mutations which predispose them to develop multiple skin cancers. A few years ago, we came out with sonic hedgehog pathway inhibitors that help treat these patients. Uh, more recently, there are some drugs in in development, that would be topical treatment for patients who have basal cell nevus syndrome or Gorlin syndrome. And we're currently enrolling for a clinical trial for patients with this particular condition right now. Another challenging condition we see a lot of is called hydronitis superativa. And several years ago, all we could offer these patients was oral antibiotics or surgery. Uh, a few years ago, we found that TNF inhibitors could be beneficial for the treatment of hydronitis superativa. Uh, but we only have one that's been FDA approved for the treatment of hydronitis. Uh, so right now, we're currently enrolling patients in a clinical trial for new treatment for hydronitis superativa. Uh, the last condition I'll touch upon is vitiligo. As many of you know, vitiligo is an autoimmune condition, and it's very challenging to treat. We have light therapies. There are some improvements with patients who undergo stem cell skin grafting. Uh, we also have topical steroids as well as topical immunomodulators. 
We're very excited that we've got a couple new topical medications that could be used for the treatment of vitiligo, and so we're currently enrolling for that clinical trial as well. Um, so today we've talked a little bit about myths in skin cancer, tanning, and sunscreen. Uh, we've also talked about a little bit of misconceptions in the field of dermatology, and we also touched upon a few emerging therapies. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take it at this time. Uh, on my last slide, I've just included a few resources that could be beneficial. Uh, the first one is the American Academy of Dermatology. Uh, they have extensive information for patients as well as providers. Um, on this website, you can also use a tool to find dermatologists in your area. Uh, the second website that I've included here is one called Germinet. Uh, this is a website that has many articles about dermatology conditions, whether they're common or uncommon. And what's a great feature about this website is it can actually translate the articles into over 20 different languages. So it's great for our patients who don't speak English. Uh, JAMA Dermatology has extensive information uh, available for patients as well. Specifically for pediatric information, the Society of Pediatric Dermatology has the most reputable and up-to-date information. Uh, if you have patients who have questions about Mohs surgery, the American College of Mohs surgery has the most up-to-date information. And specifically regarding skin cancer, the best resources would be the National Cancer Institute or the Skin Cancer Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's great information and definitely debunks a lot of the myths. Uh, for those of you that have questions, we would love to get the question as well as the answer on the audio and video. So wait for my microphone if that's OK. Any questions? OK. Ken? Doctor, can you tell us if you or your group are using, and if so, how you're using teledermatology? Uh, so teledermatology is a fascinating technology, and for those of you who don't know, teledermatology basically connects patients who are in underserved areas to uh, dermatologists at a faster rate. There are a lot of platforms that have been developed for teledermatology recently. The challenging part with teledermatology is if we see an area that needs a biopsy, the patient still has to come in for an office visit. Uh, so we do have some hurdles to kind of come through uh, before we implement teledermatology more widely. Um, in my personal practice, we actually don't implement teledermatology, but there are some offices that are offering it. Uh, it's just challenging because if we find a spot that does need a biopsy, the patient still has to come in. So there are some hurdles. I think where teledermatology will probably be the most successful would be for patient follow-up. So for example, I know there's a few of my colleagues who are doing teledermatology for acne follow-up. So the patient will initially come in for an office visit, will prescribe medication, but instead of coming back to the office, we can actually um, see them via Skype or some other mecha mechanism to do a follow-up. Uh, but there are some hurdles with the field of teledermatology. I do think it does improve access in areas where we have underserved communities and areas where it's harder to come in. Uh, my personal opinion is that teledermatology is best served for patients who have already been established and we're monitoring chronic conditions like acne or psoriasis. When it comes to skin cancer, it's a little tougher because oftentimes the patient does need to come into the office for a biopsy. Could you give a little um, lay explanation for, for us on what, what Mohs surgery is and when it's used or why it would be recommended over traditional, what we consider, you know, cut and stitch surgeries. Sure. Uh, so Mohs surgery is actually a very fascinating technique. What we do is we bring the patient into the office and we take the smallest margin possible to remove a skin cancer. Uh, we have the patient wait in the office and we actually process those pathology specimens while the patient is in the office uh, and we assess the margins. If the margins are clear, we know that that patient is cured of their skin cancer, and then we can sew them up and send them on their way home. Uh, if the patient's pathology specimen doesn't show that the margins are clear, we actually go back and take another what we call layer or another margin of skin. While the patient's in the office, we then again look at that second layer of skin to assess to see if the margins are clear. If the margins are clear, the patient can be uh, sewn up and then sent on their way home. If the margins aren't clear, we again go back and take a third layer of skin. And we continue this process until we're sure that the margins are clear. The advantages of Mohs surgery is we can take the smallest margins because we're actually assessing them in the office in real time. 
The other reason my patients love Mohs surgery is because when they leave the office, they know with 100% guarantee that the margins are clear. Because we can take very, very narrow margins in Mohs surgery, we can often get the smallest cosmetic defect. Um, Mohs surgery is generally indicated for aggressive skin cancers, recurrent skin cancers, or skin cancers that are in cosmetically sensitive areas. So for example, if a patient had a skin cancer on the nose and we cut it out with a standard excision, we may have to take five millimeter margins, uh, depending on what type of skin cancer it is, maybe even six or seven millimeter margins. So that would create a large defect. If the patient had Mohs surgery and we checked each layer, we may only need to take a one or two millimeter margin, which would mean our defect would be smaller, which would result in uh, a smaller scar and improve cosmesis. Okay, got a couple other questions. Hello, doctor. Uh, I'm a uh, patient, satisfied patient of your Oviedo clinic and Hi. have endured the Mohs surgery. Uh, my question is, is there a, a way a lay person can tell the difference between a freckle and something more serious? Uh, definitely. Um, it, that's a great question. Uh, when we look at individual spots on the skin, a couple things we want to look for is if they're growing, if they're evolving, if they're painful, or if they're itchy. Um, and so those are the kind of things we want to look for at home. Uh, if we see a brown spot on the skin and it's new and it's rapidly changing or evolving, that would be the most concerning. So um, the, the main things to look for are evolution, growth. Um, if there's any pain or itch, then we definitely would be more concerned. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Um, I saw a dermatologist years ago, and um, what I was told was that there is a high vitamin D deficiency in the state of Florida because of the sunscreen that we're putting on. Sure. Um, what is a safe amount of sunscreen to put on, and how much time is safe to actually be in the sun so we can absorb vitamin D? So um, what's interesting and has been shown in studies is you actually only need 15 minutes of unprotected sun exposure on the face and the forearms to get an adequate amount of vitamin D. That being said, I still encourage my patients to use sunscreen every single day because we know the risk of skin cancer is so much more substantial than the risk of a vitamin D deficiency. Uh, the American Academy of Dermatology put out a statement saying that we really encourage our patients to get vitamin D from diet and less from sun because we know the risks of skin cancer are so much more substantial than the risks of a vitamin D deficiency and we know we can uh, supplement vitamin D with vitamins as well as a diet. Uh, we also know that sunscreen doesn't last the whole day. So when I leave my house in the morning, I put sunscreen on my face and I put sunscreen on the forearms. Uh, now, oftentimes, I, I may not have time to reapply when I'm leaving the office at 5 or 6 p.m., and so I hope that some of the sunscreen is still there, and I'm still probably getting some UV radiation. So I still encourage patients to use sunscreen because we're all universally under applying a sunscreen, so even if we're putting sunscreen on, we're still going to get some sun rays on our skin, and that will give us a little bit of vitamin D. But overall, I'd rather patients take oral vitamin D supplementation, whether it be through diet or vitamins, rather than be in the sun for vitamin D. Um, I've also heard a couple of myths out there um, where people are saying that there are sunscreen pills or certain foods that you can eat that work as like a sunscreen. Is that true, or what, what have you heard about that? Yeah, so this is actually a very interesting area of dermatology. A few months ago at our academy meeting, um, one of the professors at Harvard, who, who's really excellent, gave a talk about these oral sunscreen, sun protective agents you can use. And so um, what's interesting is she said initially she didn't think they were going to be effective, but there is some data to suggest that there is UV protection, although very minimal, from these oral supplements. The one that actually has the most data behind it is one called Nutra X Sun, I believe. And so that's the one I've encouraged my patients to take. It is an oral supplement, and there is some data to suggest that it does help block out UVA rays. Another one we commonly recommend to patients is one called HelioCare. This is especially helpful for patients who are on photosensitizing medi medications, things like isotretinoin or doxycycline, because if you're going to have planned direct sun exposure, the supplements can help. They do not in any way take the place of sunscreen, but there is some emerging data to say that perhaps they are beneficial. The ones I generally recommend to patients are either the Nutra X Sun 
or the HelioCare. Um, they do not provide complete protection, so I would still encourage patients to do sun protective clothing as well as sunscreen, but those are things that are available on the market. They're not going to provide adequate SPF coverage the way like a sunscreen does, but they probably help a little bit, and the overwhelming data shows that they're probably not harmful. Thank you. Sorry, one more, one more question. Um, you posted um, of all of the health screenings that you have um, that are free for the community. Is that something that you're posting what's coming up on your website, or how can people know about upcoming screenings or free screenings in the community? That is a great question. I'm actually going to defer that to Patty, who actually organizes all of these events and is actually going to four skin cancer screenings today. <laughs> Imagine that, four events in one day. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so they are not posted anywhere on the website as of yet. Uh, there are special events that are community-based versus business-based. So like the Southern Women Show, four days, like she said, over 100 screenings are done each day. So that, that is posted because that's all obviously very commercialized. So any of the big community events, that'll be out there, but most of them are generally within an organization. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Martin. Good morning. Uh, with the increasing shortage of doctors throughout the state, uh, it seems that people are waiting extended periods to see their primary care physician for skin-related issues. Uh, and I think some of them, are, perhaps many of them, are constrained or inhibited by what they perceive as being the constraints within their insurance policies. Uh, is there a more direct path to consulting a dermatologist? Um, and how would that work? Is it still within the bounds of insurance? Um, is there a more direct way that somebody can actually get to a dermatologist and still have those expenses covered? So I completely agree with you in that there are some barriers to actually being seen by a dermatologist. Um, I would encourage patients to, to just call to see what insurances are covered. Oftentimes, some insurances do not require any referral from a primary care physician. Uh, there are some insurances that do require a referral, however. And unfortunately, it's very challenging for us to see a patient who uh, doesn't have a referral because those are sort of the insurance guidelines. Um, so I do encourage patients to call to see if their insurance is one that would require that kind of referral. Oftentimes they don't require a referral, um, but there are some insurances that do mandate that there is a referral. Um, I would also encourage primary care physicians to make uh, the effort to sort of refer to dermatology early as opposed to later. Uh, sometimes a primary care physician will see a patient who has a little bit of psoriasis and say, oh, well, it's not too much you need to worry about. But if you put in the referral at the time you see the patient, if the psoriasis evolves or becomes more extensive, they'll already have an opportunity to be seen by a dermatologist. Oh. Follow-up question. Um, how does my question relate for people who are on Medicare? So generally, I believe that Medicare patients can be seen without a referral. Um, unless their insurance mandates that they need a referral. But the overwhelming majority of patients who have traditional Medicare, I think, can be seen without a referral. I bet Patty has a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So if it is straight Medicare, they can see any dermatologist that they choose. If it's a Medicare replacement, it would actually depend on their replacement policy. Most of them at ADCS, we, we see almost every single Medicare replacement plan there is. The other nice thing with this group is that we do Say, see same day next day patients. So that is, we make sure we can get them in. If, you, if I can't get you in, say with Dr. Inasia, I bet you I can get you in with the physician assistant that's there, another office five miles down the road. Wow, that's awesome. Certainly cuts that 16-day uh, average for Florida down, doesn't it? Well, I'm not from old England, but New England, but we love tanning up there and um, there's a great movie, um, something about Mary, and I wanted to know the psychology behind, behind people wanting to tan so radically that they do look aged. And then I had a quick question about spray versus lotion application. Uh, so traditionally we had lotion application sunscreens and people found them cumbersome and greasy. So then manufacturers thought, was there another way to deliver sunscreen? And we came up with sprays. 
The data shows that sprays are just effect, as effective as lotion sunscreens, and so I often recommend sprays for the body. Um, there is some data to suggest, to, to, that suggests that perhaps we should do the sprays around the nose and the mouth because we don't want patients to erroneously swallow the, the sunscreen or get it in their nasal cavity. So for most of my patients, I recommend cream sunscreen for the face, lotion or cream-based sunscreen for the face, as well as spray sunscreens for the body if they choose to do a uh, spray sunscreen. Uh, the thing is, historically, sunscreen kind of had a bad reputation because we think about zinc and titanium and sunscreen being white and pasty. Um, the newer sunscreens all have micronized and nano-sized zinc and titanium particles, so they blend into the skin a lot better. So I do have patients who come in and say, I don't want to wear sunscreen because it's greasy and it's icky and it smells like the beach. But all the newer sunscreens have nano-sized and micronized uh, zinc and titanium particles, so they're much easier to apply. Uh, they go on a lot better. I do believe that spray sunscreens are safe. Um, I just encourage patients not to spray, spray them on the face. Okay, one more question, Mark. A few of us in the audience have the problem that we are beginning to thin on top. And I'm wondering if there is some form of a, uh, is there a product which you, you would suggest for use on a daily basis? Because we're constantly getting in and out of cars, walking around buildings, doing all that sort of thing. And I would imagine, although I don't know, that this is an area where skin cancer can become prevalent. Yes, yeah, so the head and the neck is actually a very high risk area for skin cancer. And what's challenging about the head and the neck skin cancers is they actually have the highest rate of metastasizing to the nodes. So with head and neck skin cancers, we're a lot more aggressive about treatment. A squamous cell on the hand has a very, very low incidence of traveling to the node. But if you have a squamous cell on the ear, the scalp, or the mouth, they have a much, much higher rate of traveling to the <coughs> nodes. So it is an area that we worry about a little bit more. Um, in terms of sunscreens, there are so many great ones. In my office, I tend to recommend the ones that uh, are very thin and easy to reapply. So the one I have a lot of success with, with patients and myself, is one called Elta MD Sunscreen. It's a very lightweight brand. Um, they have very, very high Amazon ratings, so I'm not the only one who thinks that they're great. <laughs> but it's a very lightweight sunscreen that you can use every day on the face as well as on the scalp. And patients like it because it doesn't smell like the beach, it's not greasy, and it has a high SPF. I'm glad you're writing that down, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? OK, I'll get both of you here. Oh, um, I want to say I'm a patient of yours. And um, you were not available at the time that I called in. And so I went to one of your PAs, um, Pollock or? Vince, Pollock. Vince, right, and he was awesome. Took me in on that day and removed three moles. And I want to say that it was awesome. And your staff was great too. Oh, so she is so right on about how short a time wait. In that there are other providers being the PAs and such. Great job, phenomenal. So shout out to you guys. Ah, oh, thank you. That's great to hear. You can always say who you are and where you're from too before you. Hi, I'm Carla with Topaz Clinical Research. Um, I had a question. When, when do you suggest um, that someone starts coming in for screenings? Is it based off of age, or is it based off of the time spent in the sun? Like, what is the basis for coming in for full-body screenings? Yeah, so any patients who have a family history of melanoma should probably start full-body skin checks as a teenager. Um, patients who have a family history of melanoma uh, are high risk, and so we do want to see those patients when they're younger. Patients who have over greater than 50 moles are also high risk, and so we want to start seeing them when they're young. So when they're in their teenage years, um, if you're concerned about any moles, any moles that are growing, bleeding, itching, changing, we definitely want to see those patients earlier. And unfortunately, there are pediatric patients who do develop melanoma. So children do need to be screened for melanoma. But generally, for average patients who uh, don't have a family history of melanoma, um, but have multiple moles, have had a history of tanning or sunburns, we want to see them kind of in, in their teens. Uh, through puberty, a lot of the moles change. And so during that time frame, we can see changes in the moles. And, we, and so that's normal. But when patients are kind of in the late teens, uh, early 20s, the moles are usually stable. And so unless there's like substantial changes in the patient's health, if they're making new moles, the moles are growing rapidly, uh, we definitely want to see them. Great presentation, Dr. Nasia. Um, 
I'm around a lot of people that have had cancer, uh, various different kind of cancer, not skin cancer. And what I've noticed recently is there is, when they're seeing an oncologist and they're running through every other kind of test, whether it be a CAT scan or everything else, they are now recommending you go and get a full body skin cancer screening because if it's in your lymph nodes, anywhere in your body, again, it is your large organ, they're checking everything else out. Now there's a stronger push for oncologists to refer you to a dermatologist. Are you seeing a bigger swing in that? And is insurance covering that? Uh, yes, so we are actually seeing a lot more oncologists referring to dermatology. And there is data that shows other solid organ malignancies are associated with skin cancer. The most compelling data is in patients who've had breast cancer or thyroid cancer. Uh, but I think oncologists are becoming more aware that a skin cancer screening is an essential part of uh, maintaining one's health. And so we are seeing a lot more patients from oncology. I'll tell you my biggest referrals in my office are from oncologists who recommend patients come in for the whole body skin exam. And generally it is covered by insurance. So that's not something patients have to worry about. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. One more question. Um, I'm Marjorie with Topaz Clinical Research also. Um, is there any risk to these over-the-counter fake tans that we're seeing now? Um, a lot of these younger people I'm seeing, a lot of YouTubers, where they're tanning themselves really dark, but they're buying these over-the-counters. Is there something that they should avoid, or is, this some, is there a risk to using those tanners? Um, so right now, the safety data we have shows that over-the-counter self-tanners are not dangerous. Um, and I think they're a great alternative to traditional tanning. So I do encourage my patients, if they want to be tanned, to use the over-the-counter tanners. And the safety data thus far has shown that there's no substantial risk to using those. Lots of great questions. Thank you so much. This has been so informative. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs>